Hi, it's Mark and welcome to the channel. And you join me at City Concord 2020. And I'm presenting my Murcielago, my 2003 Murcielago and my 2013 Aventador. And it's been a really great experience. I've met so many of you. Um, I've met my subscribers for the first time on my YouTube channel. It's, it's just amazing when you guys come up and you say hi. And I've also met some of my followers on Instagram. I've made new friends. And the cars are just really about love. They're about joy, celebration of life. And I didn't win a prize yesterday, which is not the point. I just loved losing to Harry Metcalf and uh, Ian Tyrrell's Esparta. Um, I just thought that losing to those guys was kind of cooler than winning a prize. So I'll show you some of the things um, that are here and there'll be a few videos and please keep watching because we've got some great footage of both these Lamborghinis being driven through London. And I can tell you now, I had so much fun watching my Murcielago being driven by Dan. It was almost kind of better than driving the car myself sometimes. So stay tuned and I really look forward to sharing this experience with all of you. So welcome, I'm with Peter who owns this gorgeous Grigio Lamborghini 400 GT and it's a car that I'm fascinated by. Peter's much further along in the game, he's a, he's a Lamborghini um, expert and also a judge at City Concours. Peter, thank you so much for allowing me to interview you Pleasure. this morning. Just tell me a little bit about your background, your car kind of history and how you became a judge at City Concours and Concours d'Elegance. It came from the fact that um, I'm on the board of the Royal Automobile Club and I'm chairman of the motoring committee there. I got involved with Concourse over a number of years and they just invited me to help select the cars to come. And as soon as you've selected a few, you then get involved in judging as well. Yeah. Um, having said that, I've been involved in a few um, international concourse events wow. on the okay. judging side. So, uh, Peter, the 400 GT, tell us about why this car is special and why this particular car looks so amazing. What, what's, what processes has it been to to get it to this level? Sure. Um, Lamborghini 400 GT was the, uh, was, was the second uh, of the Lamborghinis. Yeah. Uh, the first one was the 350. Um, when Ferruccio Lamborghini wanted to build his own car rather than uh, have Ferraris that he, that he uh, thought weren't particularly well built, uh, he built his own car, built the 350 to start with, um, and then they wanted to put a bigger engine in it, um, which is why it became the 400 with the 4 litre as opposed to the 3.5, and, and they wanted to make it slightly bigger to have it with 2 plus 2 seating. So it was the second one that they, the uh, second car model they built. They made about 200, 220 of these. Mm -hmm. uh, only five were right hand drive, yes. and these were um, uh, completed by Portman uh, Lamborghini, who were the importers at the time. They brought the, uh, um, the engineers over from uh, Lamborghini to actually do the conversion on them, and about five of them, as I say. The, um, it's unlike many of the Lamborghinis, this is, uh, this is front engined. Um, so this is, this is pre, pre, pre Mura, um, four litre engine in the front. Um, the twin headlights signify it's the 400. So, one thing I love about the 400 GT is the elegance of it. What were its competitors at the time when it was released? 
This would have been 1968. Yeah. So this is probably Ferrari 275. So welcome, and I am joined by two real experts and two legends in the Lamborghini world, Ian Tyrrell and Peter Reed. And Ian, um, I've just interviewed Peter, you'll see the piece on the 400 GT, but whilst I've got Ian, Ian's arrived to talk about some of the questions I asked him, especially about Marcello Gandini and his meeting and also his view on certain things that we're going to talk about in the next interview. But Ian, the 400 GT, for you, how is it overlooked? Why is it overlooked compared to the mural? Because it's such a beautiful car. And I, I asked Peter, why hasn't someone done the equivalent of Joe Sacchi and written a book about the 400 GT, documenting all the chassis numbers and where the cars are? Why is it overlooked? Well, that's a very good question because the um, for Richard Lamborghini's original vision when he started Lamborghini was not for the screaming supercars. Yeah. It was for yeah. the touring cars. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he had a, two, a Ferrari 250 GTE, which had a Borgen back clutch, a nine and a half inch Borgen back clutch, which his tractors used. And he went to Ferrari to complain about it breaking. Uh, and Ferrari gave him the waiting room treatment, the famous waiting room treatment. He left in a huff and said, blow you, I'm going to start a car company. And the rest is history. But that started with a 250 GTE, not a, something more, you know, a Dino SP or something yeah. extreme. So um, he started Automobili Lamborghini to build the 350 GT and the 400 GT and the Islero and the Yarama and and and. Um, and really, your question is very poignant because um, this was his this was his dream car. Yeah. It wasn't a Miura or a Countach. Yeah. Uh, he wanted a GT. He wanted an engine that could, didn't need to be overhauled for 100,000 kilometres. That yeah. was one of his original briefs. Um, and of course, you can't make a screamer that's going to last 100,000 kilometres in the 1960s. You make a nice GT engine. Um, so uh, it, they're just a great car. They're well, one of They're those, sort of like the Gordon Keeble versus the DB5. Yeah. The Gordon Keeble is a great car, but it's very, it's very underrated. You know? It just looks so more, looks so, it looks more up to date than it should be yeah. in, 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 in the modern car world. And the styling is, it's brilliant. I just think it's, it's elegant, isn't it? And it elegance is. is really hard to achieve. Yes. And there are a few tricks on the 350 and 400. Um, and just give you one example. I mean, it's all Italian styling is so clever like this. This is the only car ever built with double curved glass on every piece of on every wow. window on the car. Wow. So in the 1960s, double curved glass was incredibly difficult to make. Yes. Yeah. Um, cars like, even early 70s. You know, you look at Daytonas. You look at so many cars. They have single curved glass. This is Sparta here. Mm. Um, and to make double, double curved glass was very expensive and very yeah. few cars used it. The Citroen SM, the rear window, yeah. was double curved. Yeah. Very few cars had one piece of curved glass. This car, every piece of glass on the car is double curved. And it's, it's, it was that sort of detail. You don't notice it. It's all subliminal. Um, it's that sort of detail that, um, that, that makes these cars so special, really. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. You join me with this 1971 Ferrari Dino 456 GT and this was a really special car in the history of Ferrari. Enzo Ferrari's son Dino uh, died of leukemia and to commemorate his death he produced this smaller car and this is the car that um, we now know as the Dino and it didn't wear the Ferrari badge it wore just the badge Dino so you know Ferrari 
collectors can sometimes be very uh, fastidious about whether this car it represents a true Ferrari. However, this is um, a beautiful car and this is, I think, something that's really interesting, very pretty, and it's very rare you get to see such a collection of uh, Dinos in one place. And much like when I filmed the Mura piece, it, I don't know whether I'll ever get a chance to see this number of Dinos again. It's a very pretty car, and I think, it, you know, it, I thought it was worth coming and just giving you a little bit of a taste of it. Although I am a Lamborghini guy, um, I do really, you know, get a lot of enjoyment from the Ferrari history and the historic Ferraris too. So you join me with this Diablo 6 VT and this one best in class in era of the supercar. And the Diablo 6 is a really important car because it was styled, restyled by Luke Donkervolker from Marcello Gandini's original design. And there were several important changes that were made. One of the changes was that the front track was made wider and that improved the handling. So when you look at the Diablo 6, it's slightly wider in the front than the original Marcello Gandini design. The other interesting thing about the Diablo is that it's the only car that Lamborghini ever made where the management of Lamborghini changed three times. It changed from Chrysler to Megatech to Audi. And it's very, very difficult to design something when there's three different changes of management. The other thing about the Diablo is that when it was released in 1990, there had been a build-up of lots of difficult discussions between Detroit, where, which was Chrysler's head office, and Sant'Agata Bolognese, which was the home of Lamborghini. And the questions arose about Marcello Gandini's original design, which was much, much more sharp-edged and looked a little bit more kind of Countach related and that design that Marcello Gandini originally had was then used in the Cezetta which was a car company set up by Giorgio Moroder and if you're a fan of Top Gun Giorgio Moroder is a producer and he produced songs such as Danger Zone and Playing With The Boys those that's the guy who owned that car company and only, I think, 14 Cezettas were ever made and there's 16 cylinder cars. So the Diablo was, as I would say, had a lot to live up to. It was the first car that Lamborghini had to make that had to go over 200 miles per hour. It also had to meet the emissions regulations and it had to continue the legacy and the greatness of the Countach. So a lot of pressure. So the Diablo 6, if you look at the wheels, you'll see that the wheels are really beautiful. And those wheels were on a prototype called the Canto. And the Canto was the predecessor to the Murcielago. But when Audi took over um, Lamborghini and they saw the design for the Canto, they thought it's not going to live up to people's expectations. They ditched it, took all the technology of the Canto, including the engine, the wheels, the materials, and they put it into the Murcielago. So the Diablo 6 is a really important car. Some people say it's the most sorted of the Lamborghinis. Another interesting fact about the Diablo, which you may not know, is that the interior of the Diablo was restyled three times. And the original high-rise dash that you see on the early Diablos, and if you watch another video I've made on the Diablo, you'll see that there's this high-rise dash that was developed by a consultant ophthalmologist in Bologna University so that the needles of the rev counter and also the speedo were outside the perimeter of the steering wheel. So it's these interesting features that um, the Diablo had. And the Diablo was really designed with the benefits of wind tunnel testing and aerodynamics. 
So this was a very important car and the Diablo 6 was an important car. And the owner of this car was absolutely lovely. He loves it to death, drives it regularly. It's, got about 50, it's done about 50,000 miles. And it's just a really, really wonderful car. So this um, kind of is one of the best cars I've seen. It's inspiring. And, but I really think it's an amazing car and I hope you enjoyed this a little bit on the Lamborghini Diablo 6, which won best in class for era of the supercar at City Concours 2020. So Harry, thank you so much for your time. Pleasure. And thank you so much for uh, sharing your uh, expertise. And uh, I'll say the best video I ever, I, my favorite, I'll show over every is you reviewing the Black Diablo, the yeah. early rear wheel drive Diablo. Thank you so much for your time. It's been Perfect. fantastic. It's been great. So this is another really interesting car that I adore. This is a 1988 Countach 5000 QV. And if you've seen my Mercia Lago being serviced at Mike Pullen's place, you would have seen this car in the background. And he's done an amazing job restoring this car. And the owner who lives abroad couldn't be here to present the car, but it's an amazing car. Now the Countach is something that we are going to talk a bit more in the channel about because I do love the Countach and as I say every great V12 should hark back to the Mura and the Countach which I think are the two defining cars of Lamborghini. But as you will see this is gorgeous in white and the weather's fantastic and it just looks amazing. And the 5000 QV was a really special car because it actually was the most powerful version of the Countach and the Quattro Volve stands for four valves per cylinder. Now the Countach in its original prototype was in 1971 and that was the LP500 but they actually had to downsize the engine to a 400 and this is the first time LP was used to describe the layout between the relationship between the engine and the gearbox in a V12 Lamborghini. So the L stands for longitudinal and the P stands for posteriore. So this is because the gearbox lies in front of the engine and the engine lies behind the gearbox and I've talked about this before. So I'm just going to show you some of the features of the Countach. This is a high body Countach which is four inches higher than the original LP400 and LP400S. So you can't actually put the door of an LP5000 QV into the door frame of an LP400, it wouldn't fit. And the car was made those four inches higher by first of all altering the rake of the windscreen and that increased the cabin height and also the suspension was made slightly higher as well. The wide, wed, uh, the wide um, wheel arches and the flares of the wheel arches, they came after a Formula One owner, team owner called Walter Wolf owned a Countach and then restyled it with the wing and the flared wheel arches to accommodate the right, wider rear track to accommodate the bigger wheels. As always, crazy has happened. 
So we've successfully pushed the Kuntash into position and that's it, all done.